Well, good morning, Deb. And to the rest of you, good morning. Hey, welcome. Today we're going to begin a new series, and I am really excited about it because it affects an area that all of us deal with. If this year is really going to be our best year ever, then what we're about to deal with in this series is a relationship series. All of me is about understanding that the Bible gives us the understanding of how relationships are meant to work and to flourish. And so I hope that you'd stay with me today and through the course of this month because it is critical. And I'm excited because I believe it has the power to impact change and influence every aspect of our lives. So let's begin today. Let me ask you a question. How many here really love a good love story? Now, I don't know if you're a guy, you sometimes think, oh, no, no, no. But a really good love story, all of us can appreciate, all of us can enjoy. When I was preparing, has anybody ever seen the movie The Princess Bride? It's a classic, okay, The Princess Bride. Because why? Buttercup and Wesley fall in love, right? And they're just poor on a farm, you know, he's just a farmhand and Wesley wants to love Buttercup and marry her and she realizes he loves her and, he, and she loves him and so he goes off to make his way in life so that he can come back and marry her. But on that journey, his boat becomes attacked by the dread pirate Roberts and he's thought to be dead and Buttercup is overwhelmed in grief and five years later, she's engaged to marry the prince. That's to become king. It's a fantasy story, but what's amazing about it is this is that Wesley fights just such amazing odds because what's driving his life is his love for Buttercup, his desire that he'll do anything. He'll cross any ocean. He'll fight any battle. He'll go through a fire pit. Whatever it takes, it's an awesome story. And it's funny. There's some good parts in this. You've never seen it. But here's the point. We love it because why? Down deep inside of us, all of us want to be loved that way. All of us want someone who will fight for us. Someone who will believe in us. Someone who will stand by our side. Someone through thick and thin will be for us. Who will absolutely have our best interest at heart. To remain faithful throughout the course of life. It's a core of our being. It's a side of our personality as human beings. And why is that? Because as we're going to see today, the Bible, although it is 66 books, written by over 40 different authors, it really is only about one theme. It's only about one, it's one story that's woven through course of time because it is a love story. It is about a king who desperately longs to restore the plan, the affection, the, 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 the desire of his heart, the object of his affection, who is taken away captive. He goes through all odds. He goes through immense uh, entities of what he will endure to make the opportunity to recapture the love and affection and make a way back for the one he loves. That's the story of the Bible. And as we realize, the Bible is a book about relationships. Why? Because God created us. God is a relational God, okay? And God created us to experience fellowship and intimacy with himself and with others. You see, to understand the reason something is created, it is impossible to understand its purpose outside the mind of the one that created it. And what we'll discover is this, you and I were created by God in his own image and likeness and we were called to right relationships with him and with one another. And so here is an outlay of where we're heading in this course and it is this, what I want us to discover through the course of this series is this. When we come to love God completely, then and only then will we discover who we are and whose we are. And when we begin to see ourselves as God sees us, only then can we learn to love ourselves correctly. And when we love ourselves correctly, only when we are secure in that love, can we love others sacrificially? Can we love others unselfishly? Because the core of healthy relationships is love. But not a self-centered love, but an other-centered love. Because it's not being takers, but being givers. And it starts with God, because only when we are secure in the love of God can we love others unconditionally. You see, success in a marriage 
A healthy marriage is not based, and I know this is February, and next week we're going to experience Valentine's Day, and it sounds romantic, it sounds great on cards, but let me tell you this. The idea that the other person, oh, you complete me, okay, that's a false ideology for this reason. As long as we go into marriage thinking that someone else completes us, then we'll always be looking for something from them. They'll always be one. And so whether we realize it or not, we'll become takers and not givers. No, the Bible sets it out that the healthy responsibility of two people in the bond of marriage is two whole people who come together, who are secure in who they are, who are secure in what God has made them, that they can experience marriage that's based on this. Marriage is based on mutual submission. When two people love each other well enough, then they seek to give themselves to better the other. And when two live in that end, it is heaven on earth. And the reality of it is, until you're secure enough to know who you are, you'll never be able to love unconditionally. See, mutual submission, its simplest formation, asks a question, what can I do to help? It's always looking, what can I do to sacrifice, to serve, to do what is necessary to the one that I love to help them just be who they are. And you see, it is in that because you and I need to realize, because Jesus was asked the question regarding our humanity. He asked, he was asked this, what's the thing that God desires most from human beings? What does God look for? What commandment, what initiative, what does God want most for us? And Jesus, without blinking an eye, immediately said what the Old Testament already stated. He brings it all into focus and said this, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he went on to say, and the second command is linked to it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus puts it in order because to love your neighbor as yourself is impossible. Without knowing and understanding the love of God and experiencing it, you'll never be secure enough. Your insecurities will always be looking for something from somebody else. To love unconditionally means that you are first unconditionally loved by God. And so therefore, it is loving God completely. And so here's the big idea today. If you're taking notes with me, this is what I want to cover today. The very first installment is critical. And that's this, when we comprehend the magnitude of God's love for us. I wrote these words very carefully. See, it takes time to understand. It takes time to comprehend. When you comprehend the magnitude, see, God's love will blow your mind. When we comprehend the magnitude of God's love for us, the only fit response is to learn to love God completely. See, the Bible teaches that we are in darkness at times. We're blinded, we're lost. And what does it mean specifically? You see, when you don't understand the love of God, then there's something in you that blinds you to the truth. And when you discover the truth, the truth is that it has the ability to transform your entire life. There is no more powerful force in all of the universe than the love of God. But you will only see it in the light of God's word. It's the only thing that has the ability to dispel the darkness, to destroy the lies, and to give us. But it's like this, what I really want you to do today is to recognize I'm about to shine the light of God's word on some areas. And like, if you've been sitting in darkness for a time and somebody shines a light and you'll have the tendency to turn away. You'll have the tendency to look back. And today, things that I share with you personally and individually, you'll think, yeah, that's for somebody else. Yeah, I can see it in them. But you'll have the tendency, depending on where you are and how you see yourself, to think it's not for you. But what I want to encourage you is this. Just like with light, the more you expose yourself, the more you become adapted, the more you acclimate to it, the more it cuts a chance to get inside of you. And when you allow the love of God to get inside of you, there's nothing else on this planet that can transform your life like understanding, comprehending the love of God. But here's the deal. If you're taking notes, listen. Grasping God's love requires knowing two things. Two things. Knowing both our dignity and depravity. Knowing both our dignity and our depravity. Dignity meaning what? Dignity meaning that you're no accident. 
You are not here because of some blip in an evolutionary process that you are a divine accident. That somehow, some way, you just, whoop, there you is. No, you were the intention. You were the dream. You were the design of a creator who knew you before you were even born. I don't care the circumstances in which you were conceived, but the God who is in heaven had a design and a plan in mind that you are not an accident, that God Almighty knows you from the very core of your being. The dignity of who you are is the fact that you are the design and the handiwork of Almighty God. So we need to know our dignity, but we also need to know our depravity, which because why? Nobody else is like mankind. No one else. We are the typification of all of God's creation, and we are able as human beings to harness the forces of nature. We're able to create technological marvels in our present time, but yet down deep, we can't even control our heart or even our tongue. That is technically as advanced and is the, 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 in us is the capability to do such immense good. But at the same time, we have to face the dilemma of human nature. And where we all can agree is this. Even the 20th century was the bloodiest century on the planet. That as much good intentioned as we have, we hurt others. We can be cruel. We can be vindictive. We can be petty. We can, as, as noble as our intentions are, and as much as we desire not to hurt other people, when we're really, really honest, and come on, we're in church, we can confess, okay? As in good intentioned as we are, all of us find ourselves falling short. All of us find ourselves regretting things that we know we wish we could take back and do again. But we don't have the ability con to control because it's a, it's a universal problem that everybody on this planet can agree that there is so much potential inside of humanity for good but yeah, we hurt one another. We exploit one another. We take advantage of one another. We get into racism. We get into all forms of prejudice. We exploit other people. We go through all of this. That's the story of humanity. So it's grasping both our dignity and our depravity. You cannot understand the love of God without it. And so turn in your Bible, if you have one, to, to Psalm, the book of Psalms, chapter 8. If you're brand new to Bible reading, easy. Just go, whatever Bible you have, just go right into the middle. You'll be in the book of Psalms. Psalm 8, David here, the writer of this psalm was the famous king of Israel. If you knew, if, if Bible, you never read the Bible before, you probably heard the story of a young kid named David who went up against a giant named Goliath. Well, this is the same gentleman who grew up to be the greatest king that Israel ever had, King David. And one of the things that was amazing, the Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. And here in David's musing, you can understand why he had that distinction. Because David one day who wrote this psalm was thinking about this. And look at what he writes. He said, when I consider your heavens, he's speaking here to God. This is the intimacy he was experiencing with God. He said, listen, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. See, when you fathom, who is it we're talking about? When we say you are loved by God, who are we talking about? God, here David says, when I consider, see the Bible tells us the, the heavens declare the glory of God. God said through the prophet Isaiah, who is like me? I am like no other. God said, imagine this, the universe I measured with the span of my hand. What is that? That's the distance between your thumb and your forefinger. God measured the universe with the span of his hand. Well, what does that mean? What we've come to discover is this, that the universe is 13.2 billion light years in expanse. Well, you look at me and go, what the world is that? That number is so huge, it blows your mind. But let me help you with this. What is a light year? Well, first of all, we discovered this, that light travels at 186,000 miles a second. Man, I thought I drove fast. That is like, and so therefore, it equates to 670 million miles an hour. Wow, that's, a, that's cooking, okay? Now, what is a light year? Okay? The closest star to us is our sun, which is 93 million miles away. How long would it take you to travel there? If you got into an airplane, 
which travels approximately about 500 miles an hour, which is the average jet plane. If you got on it today and you set out for the sun, it would take you 21 years nonstop. There better be plenty of peanuts on that plane, okay? <laughs> it would take you 21 years to get there, yet light can travel there and here in eight minutes. The closest galaxy to us is Andromeda. Our solar system is contained in the, the galaxy called the Milky Way, okay? But the closest one to us is Andromeda, which is 2.3 million light years away, okay? So how far would it be when you look through, anybody look through a telescope, if you saw one of those, when they look through a telescope, the light we are seeing today, right there, leaving Andromeda from that galaxy coming here would have left when Abraham was walking this planet. <laughs> Ready to blow your mind? Who is the God we're talking about? God went a little bit further through Isaiah and he said this. He said, who is my equal? Who am I like? I am the one who counts all of the stars and calls them by name. I check whether any is missing or has any gone astray. Now, let me put this into perspective for you. There's approximately 500 billion galaxies, okay? And there are about approximately 100 million stars per galaxy. So do you know how many stars there are? I'll do the math for you. Five quintillion. You're like, what in the world is a quintillion? That's 10 with 18 zeros after it. Okay? Now watch. Yeah, like, what, I don't get that. Yeah, because to us, we're, we're, we're so tiny. That's why when we put God on trial, it's almost hilarious. Okay? But God says, I count them all. So how many, let me help you to understand this. If you were to take a penny, Okay, I want you to kind of fathom this. You were to take a penny, just a penny, average penny, right? And you were to lay one over the entire surface of this room, okay, including these two other side wings. Listen, it's 18,000 square feet. It would take 2.5 million pennies to cover every square inch of this floor. How many pennies would it take to cover the entire state of Connecticut, every square inch of it? Well, it would take 22 trillion to cover the... How many pennies would it take to cover the entire entity of the United States of America, every square inch of the United States of America, it would, it would take 8.5 quadrillion pennies. How much would it take to cover all of the surface of the planet of the earth with pennies? It would take 889 quadrillion pennies. You'd not even hit one quintillion, and there are five quintillion stars. So when God says, I call them all by name, I count them. You can't even count to a million. What are you talking about? Who is this? We're talking about God. He will blow your mind. He said, I measured the universe with the span of my hand. I know, God says, I know all of the hairs on your head. Some of us have made it a lot easier for him to count. But that God says, not a sparrow falls to the ground without my knowing it. That's why Jesus could say to you, why do you worry? Look at the birds, look at the flowers. Remember who we're talking about. This is your father. He is a good, good father. The love of God. So David says, again, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, I want you to get perspective. Then what does he say next? What is mankind? When you think of the massity, uh, the immensity of the universe we just talked about, that God sets it all in order, what are you and I that God would think about us? The, what is mankind? What is humanity that God would care about us? God, don't you got something more important to do? God, don't you got a planet to check up on? OMG, God is so good. He's thinking about you. He cares about you. Yes, it blows the human mind to realize that the God who created the heavens and the earth loves you. He has you on his mind. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? You, yeah, David's mind is getting blown away when you think about it in that regard. But then he goes on to say, verse 5, you have made them, talking about humanity, a little lower than angels. Now, let me help you with this. You probably don't read Hebrew, but the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. 
The word translated angels is actually the Hebrew word Elohim. And I can surely imagine the person translating this having the courage to write what I'm about to tell you. The word Elohim was used in Genesis 1.1. The very first book of the Bible, first verse, says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. What David is saying, you made mankind just a little lower than yourself. Are you kidding me? And then look at this. And you crown them with glory and honor. The word crowned in Hebrew literally means you clothe them. So we think about it. We read the Bible with, a, with this idea where we say, we know Adam and Eve are running around the garden naked. You know, here it is. God clothed them with glory and honor. That's what they lost the moment they sinned. That's why they ran and hid. That's why they tried to make garments. See, they were clothed with the glory and the honor of the Most High God. Yes, I believe that the Bible says when they were naked and unashamed means they had nothing to hide. There was no shame, no guilt, no will, but nothing that I had to put on a pretense about. I could be myself, know that I would be known and, and know that I could love and be loved. There was no baggage in any of it. But here, God is saying, that he clothed us with honor and glory. And then look at verse 6. This is amazing. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. Are you kidding me? We just talked about what are the works of God's hands. Besides this planet, all that he created was in the mind and the heart of God that humanity would work together with him to rule his creation. You and I have no idea. He says you put everything under their feet. What we lost by the fall? What did we forfeit from the stupidity of our actions? You see, when you recognize the dignity, here's the other side of it, our depravity. Do you have a Bible? Go to, go to, go to uh, the book of Romans, the book of Romans chapter 5. These are scriptures that I want you to go over again and again and again until it gets inside of you because what we're about to deal with, even that which we just dealt with, I use that devotionally all the time. But listen, these next scriptures are going to show because till you grasp, you can't grasp the love of God till you recognize both our dignity, who we were designed by God to be. That's why the story of the Bible was that God had a dream in the beginning. He created it, and he has never given up on it at all. It is about the extent that God went to restore the plan that he originally had. Why? Because you matter to him. Because you are important to him. God loves you, and when that registers, when that gets inside of you, when you begin to realize that the God of heaven and earth loves me that much, OMG, my mind is blown, my life is changed because the transformational power of the love of God changes us from the inside out. Here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, see, when Paul writing the book of Romans, he gives us this understanding that there are some things you can understand by nature. Creation teaches us things because you can't look at creation and not realize that somebody went through a lot of extensive purposes to make the environment we live in beautiful and conducive to life and vitality. You look at all the extent that what God went through, when you study it, that's why you should never be afraid of science. Science is only those the curious points as a Christian go, oh, so that's how God did it. Wow, that's amazing. Wow, that's fascinating. See, I'm never bold. I'm always like, do you want to debate the issue? Here's the deal. The more I discover, the more I'm fascinated to what extent he went through to make what we experience. So you can learn some things from Creation, but it's veiled. Romans teaches us you can learn some things through conscience. We all know down deep things that are right and wrong, whether we want to admit it or not. And here's what conscience teaches. Because all humanity have this in common. We consciously are aware of our imperfections. That's why we go to great extents to hide them. We all are aware of our imperfections, and the other thing we're aware of is our guilt. We know we've messed up. We just don't want to talk about it because we don't have a solution to it. But you will never discover the magnitude of God's love outside of Scripture. Because only the Scripture throws the light on what in many religions and in most minds across the world, the gospel of Christ is scandalous. There is no way that the God of heaven could love humanity to that extent, in that fashion. But let's look at it head on. Look at this. Romans 5, 6 says, you see, and it takes looking at it, you don't intuitively come to this determination. You have to see it. You have to be intentional. You see, just at the right time, when we were still 
powerless. See, what we can agree upon as humans, we know there's a problem, we just don't know what the solution is. When we were powerless to do anything about our problem, Christ died for who? The ungodly. That's why you have to grasp your depravity. Why? Because the only one that Christ will ever benefit in this life is the one that recognized that they need a savior. Because God sent us exactly what we needed. But you and I, until we're conscious of the fact that we can't save ourselves, the beauty of who Jesus is will never shine that brightly to us. See, we think, yeah, my neighbor needs it. My boss needs it. Well, but I'm pretty good. I go to church. Listen, no. Just at the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for who? The ungodly. So the first thing we, love, we learn about the love of God is this, if you're taking notes, is that it is causeless. God's love for us is causeless. In other words, you didn't merit it. You didn't earn it. There is nothing regarding what God did for us. We were ungodly. What does it mean to be ungodly? It simply means this, we were nothing like God. We fell from that responsibility. But we don't act towards others like God does. We are ungodly. Godly, as much as we try, as noble as our efforts are, we fall short. That's what scripture teaches us and we know experientially. So therefore, when you look at the love of God, God didn't send Jesus to die for people who were deserving, people who were pretty, people who were perfect, people who were skilled, people who had it together, people who, no, God sent Jesus to take care of a problem that wasn't his. It was this, and here's this, when it registers inside of you, God loves me because he chose to love me. For no other reason, because if I'm honest, God loves me and I don't know why. I, it's, God's love is better felt than telt, because I can't explain it, but I know what it does when it gets inside because it's causeless, nothing I did. So therefore, why do you act? Like God's love is something you can still earn. What do I mean by that? If you had a good week this week, you read your Bible, you did what you thought, you were actually nice to your wife. You come to church and you're ready to worship. You're ready to put it on. You're gonna put my praise on or whatever you go through. Listen, but if you had a bad week, you messed up, you sinned, you know it, you were embarrassed, you were ashamed, guess what? If you even darken the door, you're sitting there with your head hung down, your, your hands down here, and you're thinking like you're a dirty, rotten sinner. The bottom line is this, when will the love of God register inside of you that it is nothing you can earn, it's only something you can experience, it's only something that you can allow, because here's the deal, like a person that asks someone else to marry them, the person on the other end of the invitation can't do anything about the invitation, but they have all the power in the world to determine whether they will receive it or whether they will reject it. But the offer of God's love has been made to every single one of you that sit here today. All you can do with it is either accept it or you can reject it, but you can't deny it that God Almighty sent his one and only son into this world to make a way back for every single human being because he loves you and wanted a relationship with you. God's love is causeless. Secondly, look at verse seven. It says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly die. Will we realize that? His heroic stories. Anybody who's ever served in the military, you look at stories of people, a guy that for his platoon jumped on a hand grenade, we applaud that, we celebrate that, it is awesome. In fact, right now, all of the people who served in the armed forces of the United States of America who are protecting your rights, who are keeping you safe, we owe a debt of gratitude. We need to pray for them, we need to encourage them. I was reminded of something. This week, my son had to study something for school, and we had to watch this thing, and I was reminded of back of my childhood when I was a kid, too young to understand, but how we treated Vietnam vets. It was shameless. It was disgraceful. They were serving what the mili mili U.S. military told them to go out and do, and we treated them like they were enemies. We as a nation, need to understand that the people who serve on our behalf are the servants of Almighty God. And we need to pray for them. We need to recognize and give thanks for those who are willing. But yeah, yeah, we celebrate the heroicism. In fact, if you've ever served in the military, thank you for the service that you've done for this nation. Yeah, give them a hand. Well, yeah. The people who die for others, they die because they believe there's value innately in them. 
okay? We go to war not against our friends, against our who? Our enemies. So righteous people at times possibly might dare die for, but listen to this. Look at verse 8. It's mind-blowing. But God, I love God's big butt. When God butts in, it is so awesome. But God, who is so outside of the box, he is not like any one of us. He is like no human being on the face of the planet today. But God demonstrates his own love for us. How? Does God demonstrate his love? If you've ever questioned, if you've ever wondered, does God love me? This will seal the deal once and for all. When you allow this to get inside of you because you will never understand your value, you will never understand your worth, you will never know the value of who you are as an individual till this truth gets inside of you that the place for which your value was determined was when the Son of God died on the cross for you. Because why? God demonstrated his own love for us. Back to the scripture. Sorry, guys. But God demonstrated his own love for us while we were what? Still what? Sinners. Yeah, we think, hey, yeah, for my neighbor. Hey, yeah, for my boss. But no, next time I check, you need to look in the mirror. That's who Christ died for. And whether we like it or not, the truth is this. We were still sinners when Christ died for us. Therefore, the love of God, now I'll put it up. The love of God for us is not only causeless, it's countless. It's immeasurable. You can't determine its depth. You can't determine its height. That's why Paul said, this is not something you come across intuitively. He prayed, and I pray this for you guys all the time, that we would be rooted and grounded in love and be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, who is it that died for you? He said God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, who died? Christ. Who was Jesus? Who was Jesus? See, the scandalous part, people would fight tooth and nail in the world that are not followers of Christ over this issue. Who was Jesus? It's till you grasp this understanding. It seems so absolutely mind-blowing. But he was God who became human. The gospel shines so brightly when you recognize that God identified with our condition. He sent his one and only son into this world who became human in every way as we are. He was subjected to temptation just as we are, yet without sin. But why did he come? To pay a debt that he didn't owe. To take care of a responsibility that he didn't cause. Are you kidding me? We were the enemies of God. And yet God died for his enemies, not his friends, not the people that cheered him on, but the people who despised him, the people who fought against him. Yet every single one of us in this room, here is the face of God's love. I love you. And I proved it by sending my one and only son to die for what you did, not what your mama did, not what your daddy did, not what your girlfriend did, not what your friends did, what you did, what you need to fess up to. I know it, and yet I still send Jesus to die for it. And when that registers inside of you, that God would love me knowing all that I did, understanding the reason and the motive. I'm not usually honest with myself about why, but God knows it all. And yet Christ died for me. Are you kidding? It is countless. It's immeasurable. It's so huge that it takes a revelation to get. And then lastly, look at this scripture. Verse 9 goes on to say, since we have now, notice this, now, where are you today? What has God done for you today? Since we have now been what? Justified. Do you know what the word justified means? It means that you're standing before God as if, as if, as if you never, ever sinned. Just if I never sinned. Jesus took your sin. He paid it in full. Past, present, future. Are you kidding me? You gotta be kidding. That's gonna give a license for people to go out and do whatever they want to do. Well, here's the point. Love is reciprocal. If you allow the love of God to get inside of you, it transforms you because the person that you love, you don't want to hurt. And why would I cling to the things that were actually hurting me, that were actually destroying my life? No. When I see things from God's point of view, I recognize that life is different. And now that I've been justified by his blood, what, did, what price did God pay? You gotta be kidding me. He became human? He died for us? No religion in the world 
besides Christianity, has ever contemplated the fact that God would become human. But this is something, these next three words is something you need to underline in your Bible. You need to highlight. You need to star. You need to, you need to, how much more? If God went through all that extent just to provide salvation for you, why do you doubt today what he'll do on your behalf right now? Why do you doubt today that somehow you've disappointed him, he's turned his back on you, God's had it, he's kicked you to the curb, it's over, over, you've had it, you're an old dirty dog, how dare, no, 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 when it begins to register, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Your ability to have right standing with God, the Bible teaches, has nothing to do with what you've done. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us with the washing and the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit, all that God has done. The Bible said he who knew no sin was made to be sin for you, that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's a gift that was done for you. All you can do is either receive it and embrace it or reject it and cast it off. God is saying, love has already been done on your behalf. Will you receive my love? Will you respond? Because the highest ideal of humanity, the goal of God is to restore the plan that our highest ideal is when we respond to the love of God. Because no other force has the ability to transform your life from the inside out. So look, we're saved through him. For if we were God's enemies, and that's hard for us to swallow, but yeah. We were, if we were, while we were enemies, reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more? Don't you love that? If you ever question, what extent will God go through? How far will God go with you? Will he ever give up on you? How much more? Yes, humans may give up on you. Other people may call, cash it in on you and say you're hopeless, you're helpless. But God said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But will you allow it to get inside of you? He said, having been reconciled, we shall be saved through his life, not ours. Verse 11. Not only if this is so, but if we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the fact. See, that's what I'm saying to you. Once you comprehend the magnitude of the love of God, the only fitting response is to love God completely. And what does that mean? Back to, again, the question that Jesus was asked. What does God desire more than anything else? What is his number one desire for humanity? Mark has it said this way. In Mark's gospel, uh, 12, it says this. Love the Lord your God, how? With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. That's why this series is called All of Me. God wants not a part of you. He wants all of you because he's given all of himself to you. That the love relationship, love is a reciprocal. Love is a reality that the only way to experience love, see, it's not an intellectual grasping of how great love is, but it's, and we can sometimes theologically spend too long there, but God wants you to experience it. God wants you to enjoy it because you, when you allow the love of God to register inside of you, when it begins to get into your consciousness, when it begins to change the way you think, it'll begin to change the way you act. See, but it requires spending time with it. It requires allowing it to become acclimated into my life, to allow the love of God to be real to me, no matter what I feel, no matter what anybody else says, that let God be true and everyone else a liar. I believe God that his, and when it does, it has the power to transform us from the inside out because no longer do I have to go through great contortions to try to fit in and make other people accept me. When I know I'm accepted by God, your opinion of me goes down a whole lot because if you don't love me, I'm going to stick with God. Because last time I checked, he's the one that measured the universe with the span of his hand. I think his opinion is a whole lot more weighty than what you think. God Almighty, when you have that level of security, when you have that confidence, it'll create in you the understanding that God loves me. Therefore, I am who I am, and I will love others because if God loves other people the way he loves me, then how can I not love other people? But when I'm secure in the love of God, and when I view myself correctly, only then can I love other people the way they deserve by God to be loved. So he says this, so let's talk about this and end with this end. 
What does it mean to love God completely? Three realities. Number one, loving God completely means, oh, I'm sorry, did I not give the last fill in? It was causeless, countless, and ceaseless. You can't exhaust it. Ceaseless. There it is. If you don't have a spell, it's good. Ceaseless, okay? <laughs> but loving God completely involves three things. Number one, it involves this, knowing him more clearly. In other words, the more I know God, the more I love God. You know, that's what I love about small groups. The more you get to know people in our church, the more you love them. When you understand people's background, you understand their story, it gives you such appreciation. When you gain understanding of an individual, how much more with God? When you begin to see God for who he is, but how will you ever know that? How will you ever understand that? See, until the light of God's word begins to shine into your heart, you'll only be subjective to what other people think or what your emotions tell you or some of them. No, 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 no. The only way to be free, Jesus, is to embrace the truth. And when you embrace the truth that the God of heaven thinks I'm valuable, the God of heaven loves me, the God of heaven, when you begin to know that, when you begin to understand that, it's so much easier to allow God to conform the way we think about ourselves and about other people. But you see, knowing him more clearly, how do you accomplish that requires two things. Number one is time. Time. Means this, why do we encourage you to have a devotional time every day? What does that mean? Spending time with God, getting into his word, talking to him. That's all prayer is, just talking to God. Making it understand that God of heaven is not a concept or a construct of, of, of people who are weak. It's a reality of those that understand that the only way this whole thing came into being is someone of intense magnitude brought it to pass. And when that person of great magnitude is not impersonal, but the one and only, this is the way Jesus taught us to pray, our father. When he becomes my daddy, when he becomes my father, the world takes on a different meaning. And see, it takes time. It takes time to get to know somebody. It takes time to build a consciousness of who they are. Because the more you know him, the more you love him, and the more you're able to trust him and know that he always has your best interest at heart. See, you would think the thing you turn away from, the reason why you recoil from God is because you think that if you do what God's asking you to do, you're gonna miss out on something good. But the twisted, deceivable lies of the enemy has perverted the truth for ages. From the Garden of Eden, he said, can God be trusted? Oh, I know that God said, but God's holding out on you. God doesn't, no, 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 no. The only way you'll blow that all away is when the love of God becomes so real inside of you. When you know that he that asked me to do this has my best interest at heart. And the more I know him, the more I can trust him. So it requires time and it requires obedience. Because the more I begin to trust in him, the more I find how trustworthy he is. But it takes time. It takes obedience. And it's knowing. So to know him more clearly, which becomes the next part, loving God completely then involves loving him more dearly. It's the experiential side of it. It's when you allow this realization that, what God, that God loves me and I'm going to take the opportunity to allow God's love to change me from the inside out. I'm not worried about trying to put on airs. I'm not trying to worry about impressing anybody else. I'm becoming confident that who God made, God made me exactly how I am, and I am a masterpiece to him. I'm not going to look at the cover of some magazine or some photoshopped image to think whether I'm good enough or not good enough. I'm going to let those lies be blown away because if God Almighty loved me enough to send his one and only son, then why would I allow any deceitful, twisted, perverted image to get me away from experiencing? So the more I love God more dearly, what does that come down to? This is the word, priority. When God becomes my priority, see, what is it that's, that, that questions your time? Oh, I don't wish I had more time to spend with God. Well, what are you giving in exchange for it? What is worth that much? What has the ability to transform your life? The things that we think are so valuable are temporary. But the things that are eternal will change you from the inside out. The love we experience with God today will be for eternity. He is for me, then who can be against me? If he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for me, I can look at everything through my life with the confidence and boldness that God is on my side. He's got my best interest at heart. I can relax. I don't gotta try to be what somebody else wants me to be. I can know who I am and whose I am, which gives me the understanding of my value and worth. See, it's the answer to your insecurities. When you are secure in the love of God, 
then you don't have to try to play that game and try to kiss up to that reality to try to make yourself feel good about yourself. You can be good because God says you're good. Trusting God above all else. So loving him more dearly. And then lastly, look at this. Following him more nearly. Following him more nearly. It's easier to trust God the more you know him, the more his love gets inside of you. Because you see, if you don't know God that well, you look at what God's asking you to do and immediately you recoil back and say, oh, I don't. But see, the more you know God and the more you begin to believe, see, it's this, it's knowing, believing, trusting so that it, actually, it actuates into your actions, how you live. And the more you trust God, even when you don't understand, you recognize this, that the one who built the universe knows a whole lot more than me. He's got my best interest at heart. So I may not understand why he's asking me to do this, but I'm going to do it because I love him. Not because he's forcing me, not because there's a sword over my head, but because he loves me. Love is a motivator. It drives us to want to do what the one that we love would find pleasure in. Because see, love is something. God made us, and there is the uniqueness of humanity. We were created by God to receive and give love. You see, true love can only be given freely from the heart. And God knows that when we, that's why he gave us the, this is a relationship. God knows that what you do for the pure sake of pleasure, because he is the one you love, that doing what he said do is something that you're willing to do even when you don't understand it. And our father allows our love to grow when we test it in that regard, when we allow the love of God to be what motivates us to follow God. Because one of the things that doesn't make any sense to people is radical obedience. Why would that person do that? I don't get that. But so, you know something else that people never understand? Scientists have studied it for, for centuries. They never understand love. We write songs about it, the crazy things we do for love, right? Like walking in the rain, you know what I'm saying? But you know what I'm talking about, right? You look at what people do for love. Why? Because when somebody becomes the object of your affection, you put away all errors. You're like, I'm going to go out of my way to make an impression that they know that they know that they know that I love them. They'll never question. They'll never. God did that. That's what the cross represents to you. What becomes an object of our praise, we wear it as jewels and chains. In its age, it was the most horrific way for a person to die. But God has let that be the symbol. That has let that be the sign. If you ever question how much he loves you, just look at the cross. It's settled once and for all. So therefore, listen, listen. Where does this land for us? I put this in your bulletin. This is a prayer. I've been praying this. I put it in here. It's a prayer by St. Richard of Chester. And this is what I, you know, I put it in its original context. If you're, if you're into King James English and Elizabeth, you pray it just the way it is. But what am I asking you to do? Here is the the takeaway from today, to begin to pray this, number one, over your life over this next week. Is that a lot to ask? How long will it take you to actually say it? But say it like you mean it. So you can say it, this is the way I say it. Thanks to you, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you've borne from me. Oh, merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Second thing I'm asking you to do, I know it's a lot. Okay, you're like, why did I come today? <laughs> He's giving us two things to do. Isn't one enough? Here's the second. The scriptures we went over today, allow the light to shine in you so you stop recoiling. And allow it to penetrate and dispel the darkness and the lies that have controlled your life for too long. Thinking that you're not anybody thinking that you're an accident, thinking that you're a mistake, thinking that somehow you're not pretty enough, you're not powerful enough, you're not skilled enough. All of the lies that attempt to control your life, allow the scriptures to get into your heart, allow the love of God to get into your thoughts so that it get into your beliefs, so that it eventually translate into your actions. Allow them the time and opportunity to get in you. Is that a lot to ask? Imagine with me for a moment. If you actually allow the love of God to begin to transform your life from the inside out, nothing has more power 
to release you of the guilt that you feel and the imperfections that you think you have somehow. The reality is this, when the love of God becomes real, when it's something that, it's not just something intellectually you attempt to grasp, but something personally you experience. It gives you the confidence and boldness to be exactly the masterpiece that God created you to be. And the world will never be the same. Because when you walk in the truth, when you walk in the light, as he's in the light, you will live a life above and not beneath. The head and not the tail. You'll experience the power of all that God has made yours through Christ. And you won't shirk, you won't shy away. You won't think, who am I and what am I? You'll be grounded in the reality that the love of God is grasped when I know my dignity and my depravity. That in my depravity, God loved me shamelessly to send his one and only son to die for me. And in my dignity, God restored his original plan that I could be exactly who he called me to be. There's nothing in life more transformational. Imagine with me, this year will be your best year ever when you allow that truth to get inside of you and change you from the inside out.